Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of The Democratic View. I'm the hostess. My name is Phyllis Italiano, and I have with me today a very distinguished gentleman of our town, and that is our supervisor, Larry Cantwell. And how nice to have you here, Larry. Thank you so much for coming. Well, it's really a, it's a pleasure to be with you, Phyllis. You know, it's a January day. It's what, 45 degrees or more out. Uh, it's more than snow, that. Most of the snow is melted, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a good day to be out and about. Yes, it, it certainly is. And I, I have, actually, for the first time, I, I've ever made a crib sheet for somebody <laughs> to interview because there are so many things that you have accomplished in your time as supervisor. I must say, I really marvel at your capacity to know and understand all of these different issues that are going on. I, I try to keep abreast of everything. I read all the local newspapers, and I say to myself, my God, how do you people keep up with all of this? Well, you know, I, I don't know. Um, you worry about it. You, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I worry about the things that I'm not doing. I'm worrying about the things that, you know, I might have forgotten. Uh, you know, being town supervisor is, you know, really fascinating. Uh, and, you know, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, it's a big operation. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times we forget it's the town of East Hampton as an organization is, you know, a $75 million budget. It's 300 full-time employees. It's, you know, Montauk to, to Wayne Scott. Right. Um, and, you know, when you're dealing with an organization like that, you know, uh, there's a lot of management involved. I mean, there's 20 different departments, if you will, pretty much. Um, uh, and, um, you know, the supervisor ends up playing a key role in a lot of the day-to-day, -day, you know, operational decisions that get made, uh, working with the departments and the staff. Uh, and then, you know, there are certainly, you know, you know whether they're, I mean, just the personnel issues alone. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a human uh, uh, resources department, um, but um, the supervisor tends to be the one that departments go to for advice and consultation and to provide information. So you tend to be involved on a day-to-day -day basis in all the operational and management issues, you know, one way or another that occur in the town. That alone takes you know, a great deal of time, you know, and energy. Uh, and then there's certainly all the public issues that we have to deal with. I mean, um, whatever they might be, um, they're challenging. I, I, I can imagine. I, I often wonder, my goodness, when do you get time to sleep? <laughs> well, I sleep, you know, fortunately, um, I sleep well uh, when I sleep. So, you know, I, I, I get a decent night's rest, and that's always helpful. <laughs> um, and, you know, when, if you're not out at night, uh, you know, you, you get a little bit of a break by not having to go to a meeting or an event or something. Right. Um, and, you know, try to get to bed early. And, and I've always been an early riser, so I'm, I'm usually up and out of bed by 5 in the morning or something. And, oh, dear. Uh, you know, sometimes a little later. And, and I, I use the early morning, assuming I don't have to get out quickly, um, I use the early morning as, as almost a contemplative and relaxation time for me. It's a time for me to you know, get my coffee and settle in. I start answer, you know, looking at my emails from, you know, the night before. But, but it, it's a relaxing time of the day for me, assuming I don't have to run right out the door. Um, and, and, you know, I'm up and about early and out of the, you know, out, out, out of the house uh, fairly early in the morning. So, um, and then the days bring what they bring. <laughs> Wow, yes, I, I, and your day is certainly very full. I mean, I had, I limited myself over here to seven different things that I wanted to bring sure. up. And the first one, of course, is the wonderful job that you have done as far as our resources and our money is concerned. You've got top credit rating. Now, that's yeah, really that, a great you know, achievement. Been, I mean, if you look back seven years ago yes. when the town was in very, diff in very poor financial condition with a huge deficit and... Uh, a lot, there was a lot of justifiable concern for the condition of the town's finances at that time. And look at the effort that was made by the prior supervisor. I yes, certainly I give Bill credit for. Yes. Uh, you know, he had a lot of tough choices to make. Um, whether I would have done exactly what he did, at the, the way he did it, I, I'm not sure that's the case. But I still give him credit for 
making some hard decisions and, and putting the town on a stronger financial footing. And, and, and we have continued that effort uh, over the past, uh, you know, three years. We balanced every budget. Um, you know, we stayed within the tax cap. We lowered the total debt of the town uh, by uh, over uh, 20 percent. Uh, at one point, the town had over $140 million in debt. Wow. Uh, we got that number down to about 100. Uh, and we're on a schedule and a plan to reduce that uh, to, uh, to about $80 million, um, over a six-year period. So, you know, we're looking at a major reduction in the total debt of the town. And what's the benefit of that? The benefit of that, and <clears throat> I mean, the consequences of that have been when I took office, uh, one out of every five dollars in the budget, one out of every five dollars in the budget went just to pay debt service. Um, so it was a burden. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, over the next two or three years, the town is going to accrue some major benefits from the debt reduction that we have, uh, you know, uh, carried out. Um, so, yeah, I feel good. And then, you know, this, this past summer, the town was awarded, a, uh, you know, a AA1 credit rating, which is the highest credit rating uh, the town has had in, uh, uh, matches the highest uh, credit rating the town has ever had. Uh, and, you know, I think if we continue with the fiscal discipline that we have in place, I think the town um, will be looking at the potential for a AAA credit rating, you know, in the next few years. Uh, wow. and that's sort of the gold standard of credit rating. So uh, I think, you know, no matter how you cut it or no matter how you, or who you give credit uh, to, uh, for it, um, you know, there's been a really remarkable recovery I think the town has had financially over the past six or seven years. Uh, and a lot of that credit, frankly, goes to the finance staff. Uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to Len Bernard, um, who, you know, I reappointed as budget officer. Yes. Uh, some people were concerned about that three years ago, and I made that decision because, you know, Len has had a history of being a Republican. He's run as a Republican candidate. Uh, he served as a Republican candidate. But I have found Len uh, to be very professional in his work. A, a major asset to me and to the town, and he's been a bit, been a big part of helping to orchestrate and helping helping us carry out this financial recovery. And it probably was very wise of you to keep him on because, after all, he knew from whence he was coming and what the problems were, and therefore there was not an interruption in in his uh, ability to uh, help you out as you were working on this recovery. I, you know, I got interested in, in East Hampton as I was retiring at just about that time when we, it f fell off the cliff. And so I have followed that very closely, and it's really been a remarkable recovery. And I, as a citizen, I certainly appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's, it's good for, it's good for, it, you know, everything we do relates to finances. Uh, That's you know, right. Uh, certainly in town government, everything we do relates to time. So, you know, you need to be on a strong financial footing if you're going to carry out things that serve the public and, and make improvements in the town. It's sort of like running a family, too. Same thing. <laughs> you know. Got to balance that checkbook. That's right. <laughs> Just on a bigger scale. Right. So uh, one of the other areas that you have had great success with is your land preservation, which, of course, uh, those of us who are dying to keep this having a rural quali quality to East Hampton, and it's what I fell in love with, I think, when I came out here the first time. It was looking over open fields and having that sense of, of uh, wow, you know, seeing wild turkeys and all of these wonderful creatures that live around us. Even the deer, by the way, I, I got it, you know, I love them when they're not in my backyard, and I don't care if they're on my front yard, <laughs> you know. But, uh, but that land preservation has been a wonderful thing, and you've done a great job with that as well. I, I'm very proud of the town board's record in uh, uh, the preservation of land uh, throughout history. Um, and, you know, the town board in the past three years has had a very aggressive policy using CPF funds to acquire open space. Um, you know, we've acquired... Um, somewhere between 350 and 400 acres of land over the past uh, three years. Of course, the values of real estate are very high in our community. 
Um, so you know, it, it, you know getting a you know a, a bang for your buck is very difficult. But you know the CPF process is pretty clear and well founded. Uh, you know it goes through uh, I think a high level of scrutiny. Uh, you know in terms of uh, parcels that are chosen and reviewed by the CPF committee advisory board, who ranks every parcel that is under consideration, recommends those to the board. Uh, the board reviews them. The planning staff uh, reviews them for their environmental significance. Um, uh, appraisals are obtained, professional appraisals, establishing a value. Um, and uh, then the board chooses uh, to negotiate, you know, to acquire parcels uh, as, it, uh, as it prioritizes those. And uh, yeah, the board has been very aggressive. And I think all the board members share a view that you know, every parcel of land that we're able to preserve, especially those that are the most environmental, environmentally critical, whether they're a wetland or, or a farmland or, or, or the important areas of town that lie over our water recharge areas uh, that help protect our drinking water, um, have, you know, we've been aggressive in acquiring land. And I hope to continue to do that. I think uh, it's critically important. And, you know, we were supporters of the extension of the CPF uh, Yeah, that program. was the next thing I was going to talk about, was that, uh, right. of course, Which, being uh, an absolute uh, devotee of water quality, uh, that is really the key issue in this area. Uh, when you think about how Suffolk County went from 250,000 people in 1950 to almost a million and a half now uh, right. that we know of, you know, then there's all the people we don't know of, you know, who are still living here. And, and our water quality is very important because when you can't drink the water. Yeah, no, the, the, the CPF uh, uh, extension um, is a terrific story. I mean, 78 um, percent, I think that's the correct percentage, of the voters voted yes, in favor of continuing the CPF program, which you know, taxes the sale uh, of real estate. Um, it's generated um, over $300 million uh, wow. since its beginning, which I think was 1992. Uh, and what's interesting about this and worth talking about is, you know, when we looked at the CPF extension uh, and looked at in extending that, uh, the voters approved the extension of the plan to the year 19, uh, 2050. Uh, and also allowing the use of up to 20% of those funds for water quality. So that would be a new way of using some of the money. Um, and we look back to 10 years and look at the average amount of revenue that the town had received. We project that by the year 2050, the CPF program will, will raise uh, over $800 million in the, in the next 33 years. Wow. Uh, so if you apportion that, and, and take 20% of it for water quality programs and improvements and protection. That's about 160 million for water quality, and it's about 650 million for to continue to buy open space. Uh, so you know there's going to be an ample sum of money for the town to continue to aggressively acquire uh, and preserve land. Uh, which is critically important, and it's going to provide almost 150, 160 million for water quality. And what we have to do is we've got to, we have to get rid of these legacy cesspools and the septic systems that are leaching nitrogen into our bodies of water. I know you well enough to know you're a great swimmer. Yes. You enjoy the beauty of places like Three Mile Harbor and um, you know Gardner's Bay. Uh, that it's not Gardner's Bay, it's Phyllis's Bay. Phyllis's Bay. Right. Uh, you know, that, that, that's an a, that's, that, we can't put a price on those assets, Absolutely. whether we fish in them or swim in them or clam in them or just enjoy looking at them and knowing that we have beautiful, pristine water here. You can't put a price on that. That's everything that we're about here as a community, and it's a major asset to us. Uh, and it also drives our economy as well. And it well. drives our economy. Uh, so we've, we've got to do everything that we can to protect that. So, uh, so the point that I am really thinking about is, are you in the, uh, is the town in the process of figuring out what it's going to do and how it's going to yes. allocate that money? Yes. Well, you know, we did a, a, we did a water quality improvement a plan that was adopted. You know, that was vetted. Hearings were held. Meetings were held and adopted. So we have a pretty good idea of what we need to do. 
And one of the things we need to do is we need to stop the nitrogen from getting into these bodies of water. Right. Uh, we're working on a plan that we will vet publicly and hold hearings on and have discussions publicly about that would provide rebates uh, to homeowners to replace their failing septic systems with new technology, some of which has already been approved by the Suffolk County Health Department. Finalmente. It's say it in my language, you Let's know. Let's get going. <laughs> Finally, because I waited for it for so long. Right. And this, this, you know, the new technology will remove 70 or 80 percent and maybe even higher of the nitrogen that's currently leaching out of our old-fashioned cesspools and septic systems into our harbors and bays. And we need to encourage as many people, and we're going to do that by using some of the CPF money uh, in water quality to provide rebates to people to help pay And I will for, be the first in line. To help pay because for the replacement of septic systems with yeah. the new technology and eliminate this terrible nitrogen problem that we have. Yeah, no, it's like, it's like when we had the rebates for, for uh, underground oil tanks. Same you know, concept. I, and, and that uh, was very successful. Oh, I, I, I did it uh, I right away. I mean, everybody done that I know did it because it was reasonable and it, it was something that uh, we knew would protect our water. You know, because the truth of the matter is the water you drink comes from close to where you live. It's not from far, far away, you know. A lot of people uh, in a lot of parts of our community uh, are drinking, you know, water from their own private well on their property. Right, like uh, me. And even people who are uh, getting public water, you know, a lot, most of that water is coming from the aquifer in our town. That's right. And uh, being pumped to your house. So protecting that asset is, you know, protecting our future. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and it is the most important issue that we face right now. And, uh, and, uh, but there are other things that we have to talk about, too, okay. because I know how busy you always are and working on so many things. And um, one of the things we, we were interested in was sustainability. I know you guys have a goal of uh, being completely sustainable. Uh, I think it was 2017 or 2020. 2020. For, for our electric needs and 2030 okay. for all of our energy needs. Right. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, I mean, uh, we, we had an, uh, a, we have an energy sustainability committee that works very hard. Very smart people. Yes. Uh, exploring these issues, set putting plans together, and uh, with a lot of substance to them. It's not just um, a lot of rhetoric. Um, and they they put a plan together. Um, and the town board adopted a sustainability policy, which was very aggressive, got a lot of, uh, you know, attention. And some people scoffed at it and said, well, you know, it's, it's never going to happen. And the truth is, it's actually happening. Uh, you know, we were given credit for our establishing our goal and certified by the state of New York uh, as a climate uh, smart community. Uh, you know, we had adopted a climate action plan in addition to the energy sustainability plan. Uh, we've attracted almost $300,000 in state grants because of our efforts to help us implement uh, renewable resources, energy conservation, and other measures uh, throughout the town of East Hampton. Uh, the state of New York then itself, under the governor's leadership, adopted an energy goal for the state of New York. Um, you know, and you know, I think it's very likely that um, uh, you know, uh, that we're going to have offshore wind power 30 miles east of Block Island yes. that's going to be providing electricity for the South Fork. A lot of people don't realize we have um, a deficit here, you know, that, 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 that the power company is not able to provide the power that we need during peak periods, and there's a deficit that's starting this summer to the point where <coughs> uh, PSEG is going to have to bring temporary generator stations, two of them, out here um, in order to m fill that void between our peak power, you know, the highest power demand that we have on an August weekend or whenever it might be. Um, and that deficit's going to keep getting worse each year because our energy demands on the South Fork keep going up. So we have to find a way to use our energy more wisely. 
and we have to rely on renewable energy in the future um, in order to be smart and cost effective. And we live in a coastal community, and we're already seeing the effects of sea level rise and the potential danger mm. that that is going to be uh, along our coast which is a whole other major issue that this Well, it sure is, and, 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 and there's no denying that this is not happening uh, to our coast because we, we see it, we see it in Montauk particularly, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult, difficult situation, and I hope that uh, we will continue to get some help in the future. Well, we have, we have, you know, we did apply for and we did secure a $250,000 grant from the state of New York again um, to do a coastal assessment uh, uh, and resiliency plan for the town of East Hampton. That process has begun. We've chosen consultants and experts to help advise us. We have an advisory committee. And, um, you know, that's going to take on some really tough questions about, you know, how do you deal with the potential major damage that can occur in some of these very low-lying areas. And how can we plan for those today and not wait for them to happen and then react to them when they happen? Because if we start reacting to them, we're not always going to make the best decisions. And if we can sit down, if we can assess the situation now and sit down as a community and, and, and face the con potential coming consequences now, and thoughtfully plan out how we're going to deal with these things, we'll make better decisions than we will if we wait till the last minute and overreact. What a smart approach, I must say. I'm, I'm really marveling at hearing you say this because most people don't live their lives that way. They just let things happen and then they say, oh my goodness, and, and rush to, to make some adjustments to what's happened to them. But as a town and as a leader of the town, you can't do that. Well, we, we, look, we, you know, you try to lead, and we talked about this at the beginning. I mean, these are the things, believe it or not, these are the things that a town supervisor thinks about. I mean, you know, it's the day-to-day -day things, the problems, the meetings that you have, uh, maybe a problem that an individual constituents have that you're worried about and you're trying to f resolve, but you don't always have the answers. Um, but you've got to, we have to keep making progress in trying to make this the best community that we can. And you have a couple of other little issues that are just oh, having to do with the people's needs. Like I know that uh, uh, the Southampton Hospital is looking now to have some kind of a, uh, a situation where they can help people instead of uh, in emergencies, instead of having to, you know, buck, particularly in that summer traffic, which is. I, th I, th I, th I think uh, the hospital's proposal uh, to build a 24 hour a day. 365 day a year emerge standalone emergency room or emergency care facility um, will be one of the most important improvements to be made in emergency health care in this community in a really long time. Uh, the drive back and forth to Southampton that these ambulance drivers have to make and, and our patients have to um, you know wait uh, for the care that they would get in an emergency room is becoming more and more difficult and more and more draining every year. And to have that kind of a facility in our town where you can get to it in a few minutes as opposed to uh, the wait that it would take. Imagine imagine being an uh, ambulance volunteer. You're volunteering your time. You've gotten the training that you need, uh, which is extensive. And you're responding to calls, and, and, and you're serving in the Montauk Fire Department's ambulance squad. Uh, and the effort that you have to make to respond to that call, drive all the way to Southampton Hospital and all the way back in the middle of the summer, your day is shot. Yeah. You know, and we're putting way too much, way too many demands on these volunteers, and people's lives potentially are at je exactly. jeopardy here. So exactly. this this facility is critical to the emergency healthcare needs of our community in the future. And then also, as for the fact of the matter is, is that, uh, uh, I hate to say it, but we are considering people like me who are aging out here. Well, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know anybody's going the other way. Yeah. Everybody's getting older. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, 
there are probably greater needs now than there were years ago. Well, we also have an aging population. We have a very, a very high, a lot of people don't, don't realize what a very high proportion of our population are elderly or yes. over 65, let's say. Uh, and, and it, you know, it, it, in some ways, is a bit of a this is a bit of a retirement community. Yeah, some people do live here, retire, and move elsewhere. But we also have a lot of people who are retiring here in place. And some of us, or you know, some people certainly spend part of their time, you know, in warmer climates, but still retain their home here in East Hampton. So we have a high proportion of our population uh, who are senior citizens, and you know, the demands for health care is even greater for that age group. And also, I, I know on the on the horizon is uh, something about the the senior citizen center, which I believe you are going to be yeah. interested in uh, revamping and and doing something to upgrade that particular establishment. Yeah, you know, Councilwoman Kathy Burke Gonzalez has t taken a leadership role there. She's the liaison to uh, human uh, the human services, and that includes the senior center. Um, and th that facility is old, antiquated, uh, frankly embarrassing in some ways for its because of the neglect, and needs to be replaced. So it, it, on our agenda, we've already uh, chosen the site, which is the current site. Uh, we think we can maintain the facility that's there, build a brand new facility there, uh, and to replace the old one. And we look forward to that. Uh, we have engineers and architects ready to go. You know I have more things on my <laughs> list here that we're not even going to be able to get to. Well, have my it. dear, I just hope that you eat a very good diet, get your rest, because we need every bit of your energy. <laughs> Thank you, thank so, you so much for coming. My goodness gracious. Happy to be here with you. <laughs> I hope you get some time to uh, relax a little bit. Well, we, we get away maybe this winter for a long weekend or something. and. Uh, we get a break once in a while, so that's fine. Jeez, that's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, seriously, there are more items here and I'm not even going to get to. <laughs> and besides, we hope that you're going to do it again. Well, we'll see. We'll be making that decision, you know, in, in the very near future. Um, okay, so we're just about over. Well, again, it's a pleasure to be with you, Phyllis, and uh, I look forward to the new year. we got a lot of work to do. We sure do. Yes. And the town board, you know, has been great, and we're ready for the challenge. Yes. And you do, and you work so well together. It's a good group of people who.